I'd like to introduce Professor Wald uh, first by saying when uh, March 4th got started in November, uh, we went to uh, George at Harvard and asked him to speak and asked him to help us. And even though it was a crazy idea, he said yes. And he's been with us ever since. Um, He's been active in the peace movement. Uh, he's been an active teacher. He's won a Nobel Prize for, in physiology for the mechanics of seeing how we see. And he's here to talk to us about some of his observations. Uh, the title of his talk is A Generation in Search of a Future. Professor Wald. All of you know that in the last couple of years, there has been student unrest breaking into violence of various kinds all over the world. In England, Germany, Italy, Spain, Japan, Mexico, and needless to say, in many parts of this country. And there's been a great deal of discussion as to what it all means and what it's all about. Perfectly clearly, it means something different in Mexico from what it does in France and something different in France from what it does in Tokyo, and something different in Tokyo from what it does in this country. And yet, unless we are to assume that students have gone crazy all over the world or that they've just decided that's the thing to do, there must be some common meaning. I don't need to go so far afield to look for that meaning. I'm a teacher, and at Harvard, I have a class of about 350 students, men and women, most of them freshmen and sophomores. And over these past few years, I felt increasingly that something's awfully wrong. And this year, ever so much more than last, something has gone sour in teaching and in learning. It's almost as though there are a widespread feeling that education had become irrelevant. I'd love to know what that is. A lecture is much more of a dialogue than many of you probably appreciate. There's stuff coming back at you all the time while you're teaching. And I began to feel particularly this year that I was missing a lot of what was coming back. I tried asking the students. They couldn't tell me anything very relevant. But I think I know what's the matter. I think I know it even a little better than they do. I think that those students and this whole generation is beset with a profound uneasiness. I don't think that uneasiness is quite defined, but I think I understand it, and that disarms me, because much as I should like to reassure those students, I think I understand the good reasons for their uneasiness even better than they do. I share that uneasiness. What's bothering those students? Well, some of them tell you very promptly, the Vietnam War. I think the Vietnam War is the most shameful episode in the whole of American history. War, war crimes are an American invention. We've committed all of them in Vietnam, but I'll tell you something interesting about that. We were committing them in World War II before those Nuremberg trials were ever held and the principles stated. I've gone through all that history lately, and I find that there's a gimmick in it. And that gimmick is that if one can allege an aggression. After that, everything goes. 
And you see, we're living in a world in which all wars are wars of defense, all war departments are defense departments. This is all part of the double talk of our time. Nobody is an aggressor anymore except those on the other side. And this is why that, that Neanderthal among uh, secretaries of state, Rusk, went to such... went to such pains, went to such pains and stuck by his guns because uh, in him uh, stubbornness and density take the place of character. Uh, <laughs> went to such pains to insist, as he still insists, that in Vietnam we are repelling an aggression. And if you're repelling an aggression, anything goes. I think we've lost that war, and a lot of other people think so by now. You see, the Vietnamese have a secret weapon. It's their willingness to die. They are more willing to die than we've yet quite screwed our willingness to kill uh, to reach that level. We've gone a long way far enough to uh, sicken many Americans, far enough even to have sickened our fighting men, far enough so that our national symbols have gone sour. How many of you can sing the Star Spangled Banner today and when you get to those noble lines about <coughs> the rocket's red glare and bombs bursting in air, what are you thinking of? except that those are our bombs and our rockets bursting over South Vietnamese villages. When those uh, words were written, we were a people struggling for freedom against oppressors. Now we're in league with oppressors all over the world. Oppressors against people struggling for their freedom. But that Vietnam War, shameful and terrible as it is, I want to say is only an immediate incident against a background very much larger and more stubborn issues. Part of my trouble with students, and it horrifies me, is that almost all the students I teach were born since World War II. And you know, after World War II, just after World War II, a whole series of new procedures came into American life that we older people regarded as temporary aberrations. We'd get back to normal American life someday, but those procedures have stayed with us, and those students of mine have never known anything else, and they think those things are normal. They think we always had a Pentagon. They think we always had a big army. And they think we always had a draft. But those are all new things in American life. And I think they're incompatible with everything that America meant before. They mustn't be taken as normal. How many of you realize that just before World War II, the entire American army, including the Air Force, 139,000 men. Then World War II started, but we weren't in it yet, but seeing that there was great trouble in the world, one doubled this army. It was then 268,000 men. And then in World War II, it got to be eight millions. And then World War II came to an end, and we prepared to go back to a peacetime army somewhat as the American army had always been before. And indeed, in 1950, and you think about 1950. The Cold War was on and World War II was over. We still had an aftermath of that army. 
we got down to 600,000 men. Now we've got three and a half million men, 545,000 approximately in Vietnam, 300,000 National Guardsmen and 200,000 reservists as of last year had been trained for riot duty in the cities. 500,000 men trained for special military work in our own country. And why I, why I say that the Vietnam War, in my book, is just an immediate incident, is that if we keep that big army, it will always find things to do. And we're going to be. And we're going to be in another such holocaust before you know it, abroad or here at home. That draft, you don't want to reform the draft, you want to get rid of it. The draft peacetime draft is the most un-American thing I know. All the time I was growing up, I was being told about those horrible Central European countries in Russia where young men were impressed into the army. And I was told what they did about it. They shot off a finger. They chopped off a couple of toes. Or if they could manage it, they came to this country. And we understood that and were glad to welcome them. And now, present estimates are that five or six thousand young Americans have left this country for Canada. Two or three thousand have gone to Europe. And many more are preparing to emigrate. I received what to me was an exceedingly shocking letter from the editors of the Alumni Bulletin back last fall setting a series of questions that might be asked the professor at Harvard by his students relative to what to do about the draft. And I was asked to write a series of answers of what I would tell those students. Well, all I had to tell those students was that if any one of them decided to evade the draft by any means that he could fathom, I would help him to the maximum of my ability. But, but I had a lot else to say in that statement, but that was said not to the students, but to the Harvard alumni. About a month and a half ago, a bill was introduced in the Senate by a very strange group of senators at uh, it covered the whole spectrum. Uh, first time I've noticed George McGovern and uh, Barry Goldwater in on the same bill. Uh, it's a bill to uh, stop the draft. And I hope it goes through. But you know, anything Barry Goldwater's for, I re-examine. And... Uh, I find that, uh, in fact, there is a spectrum of opinion that involves getting rid of the draft. And I'd like to tell you what I think about that. We have much, much, much too big an army. When we get rid of the draft, it must be to cut down on the size of that army. From where I sit, a million men is surely enough. And if someone thinks we need more than a million men in the army in peacetime, I'd like to hear those arguments. There's another thing being said, closely connected with this, and that is that to keep a volunteer army in being, one would have to 
raise the pay considerably, offer much larger rewards. That's said so positively people believe it. It isn't true. The great bulk of our present army, three and a half million men, the great bulk of those three and a half million men are volunteers, real volunteers, in the first-term enlistments. Only 21 percent are draftees. 49 percent are real volunteers. There's another, gee, 30 percent. Another 30 percent are so-called reluctant volunteers, that is, people who wouldn't be volunteering unless the draft were breathing down their necks. Only 21 percent true volunteers. All the re-enlistments, however, of course, are true volunteers. The great bulk of the present army are true volunteers. Whole services are volunteer. The Air Force, the submarine service, the Marines, all volunteer. And that's the evidence that the pay's quite good enough. There's nothing very wrong with that pay. And incidentally, there was a bill in 1967 that raised the pay. It's being raised in three installments. The third installment, as I recall, coming this coming April. So when you hear people explaining, ah, yes, they're for a volunteer army, but it's going to cost $17 billion a year more, don't believe it. That's just to scare you off. We don't need this big an army. We can get the army we need as volunteers, and we can get it at present rates of pay. But there's something ever so much bigger than the draft. That draft is just an immediate incident, something one can seize hold of at once. And that bigger thing, of course, is the military, industrial, labor union, I'm sad to say, complex. That's, I think, the real enemy. I don't think we can live with it at anything like its present level. What happened under the plea of the Cold War was not alone that we built up the biggest, the first big peacetime army in our history, but we institutionalized it. We built it, I suppose, the biggest building in our history and uh, institutionalized it. And I don't think we can live with it and keep America anything like we have known it, or you who are too young, anything like America as it has been before. It's corrupting the life of the whole country. We can't live with that 80 to 100 billion dollar budget a year. It's buying up everything in sight, and it's only the latest thing it's bought, that it's bought the labor unions. And don't Make any mistake, it's made astonishing inroads into the establishment of science in this country. And I'm not talking about people who are getting government contracts or DOD contracts. That's all been talked about, will be talked up about some more from this platform. But there's another feature of this that disturbs me very much. And that is, you know, in recent years in our innocence, almost every scientific society in the country was sold the idea of establishing a Washington office. We were going to have lobbies like everybody else. And so now we've got ourselves a secretariat in Washington attached to practically each of the, certainly all the major scientific societies. Those secretariats are full of bureaucrats, just like all the other Washington bureaus. And they look for things to do, for more influence, for more money. They go moonlighting. And there's that Department of Defense with money to burn. And so, one has these very peculiar manifestations, you know. I'm a biologist. The AIBS, the American Institute for Biological Sciences, about a year ago, with a nauseating uh, display of hypocrisy, announced that they were uh, staging two scientific meetings under the sponsorship of Camp Dietrich. The first of those meetings 
Symposium. It wasn't called defoliation, no. It was called leaf abscission. <laughs> the, second, the second of those meetings had nothing to do with biological warfare and infection of the enemy, oh no. It was called the introduction of foreign DNA. I was called by a man in Washington some months ago who told me, to my enormous surprise, that he was the director of biological research for, of all things, the Federated American Societies for Experimental Biology. I didn't know they had a director of biological research, and I haven't the least idea what such a person might conceivably do. But uh, what he was on the phone for was to tell me that the Department of Defense had asked him to organize a committee to go into visual problems connected with the use of some new uh, weaponry. I'm sorry to say that the worst offender in this regard has been the National Academy of Sciences and the outgoing president of the National Academy of Sciences. And I, for one, as a member, find this a shocking thing. The outgoing president of the National Academy of Sciences has been simultaneously the chairman of the Scientific Advisory Board of the Department of Defense. That $80 billion a year, the Defense Department is always broke, but they throw that money around like drunken sailors. They go in for uh, Buck Rogers uh, projects of the wildest and most insane kind. How many of you know it was all in the New York Times and then a good scientific article written about it in Science a few months ago. How many of you know that the Rocky Mountain Arsenal on the outskirts of Denver manufactured a poison on such a scale that there was a problem of waste disposal, so nothing daunted, they dug a tunnel two miles deep under Denver into which they've now injected so much water that beginning something over a year ago, Denver began to suffer a series of tremors, earth tremors of increasing severity, and uh, there is grave fear that Denver is about to have a major earthquake since it is now floating on a lake <laughs> of poisoned water. You all heard about those uh, 6,000 sheep that suddenly died in Nevada. I couldn't help wondering about the shepherds. And uh, maybe, maybe, maybe some of you remember a place called Kisan. that will undoubtedly go down in the history of American heroism. There was dumped on Khi San during one episode of the Vietnam War more explosives than fell on Japan throughout World War II and more explosives than fell on the whole of Europe in the two years 1942 and 43. One of the men, one of the officers at Kisan, spoke about this, not in disapproval, but in awe. His words were, it looks as though the world had caught smallpox and died. And that's the only real issue. The only point of government is to safeguard and foster life and our government has become preoccupied with death, with preparing killing and being killed. You've been hearing about the ABMs. I don't have to talk about them. Everyone else is doing that. It's a curious thing. In September 1967, so kind of a long time ago, 
We had a meeting here in this area of uh, MIT and Harvard people, including those who knew most about these matters, to talk about whether there was anything that could be done to block the Sentinel system, the deployment of the ABMs. And a couple of the most knowledgeable persons present said, what's the use of fighting about a dead issue? That's been decided. Let's go on from there. Well, fortunately, it's not a dead issue. But an ABM is a nuclear weapon. It takes a nuclear weapon to stop a nuclear weapon. And our concern is with the whole issue of nuclear weapons. There's a whole semantics that tells us not to talk in the way I'm about to talk. It involves such uh, phrases as, those are the facts of life. No, they're the facts of death, and I don't accept any of them, and I advise you not to accept any of them. All the pressures are to make us accept things that seem to represent decisions that have been made. And let's go on from there. We can't go on from there. And we'd better stick with those issues. We are told that uh, the United States and Russia between them have by now stockpiled approximately the explosive power of 15 tons of TNT for every man, woman, and child on the surface of the Earth. And yet we are being told, and indeed we are being told by the people in the seats of power, by our new uh, Secretary of Defense, so-called. Uh, he's, uh, he's, he's brought up an exceedingly ingenious and uh, lovely thought. To wit, let's increase our armaments markedly so that we can disarm from a position of strength. <laughs> you know, All of you know there isn't any defense against those nuclear weapons. They're absolutely insane. At the very moment that we talk of deploying ABMs, we are also talking of, I'm not up to date, perhaps we're already engaged in manufacturing, the MIRVs to circumvent ABMs. So far as I know, no one has ever estimated a major nuclear war in terms of American losses smaller than 50 million people. We've grown up on gruesome statistics, and by now a gruesome statistic is only another statistic. And you have a sort of mental image, you know, of a bang. And then you read the newspapers next morning if you're still there and you find that 50 million people were killed. But that isn't the way it happens. When we succeeded in killing 200,000 people with those uh, old-fashioned homemade nuclear weapons that we used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 200,000 were killed, but another 200,000 were maimed, blinded, burned, poisoned, doomed. And that's the way it would be. It isn't that there'd be a bang and then a certain number of dead to be buried. It would be that the whole nation would be full of groaning, screaming, tortured, doomed people. I think by now, You've all heard the words of Senator Richard Russell of Georgia, who finished a speech in the Senate by saying, if we have to start over again with another Adam and Eve, I want them to be Americans. And I want them, and I want them on this continent and not in Europe, end of quotes. That's a senator of these United States holding a patriotic speech. Well, here's a Nobel laureate who looks on those words as criminal insanity.
How real, how real right now is the threat of full-scale nuclear war? Well, I have my own very inexpert ideas, but fearful that I may be a little paranoid on this subject. I take every opportunity I can to ask the reputed experts. I ask that question of a very distinguished professor of government at Harvard about a month ago. I asked him what sort of odds he would give, what sort of bet he would be willing to lay on full-scale nuclear war within the next 20 years and within the next 30 years. That's your generation we're talking about. Oh, he said very comfortably, I think I can give you a pretty good answer to that question. I estimate the probability of nuclear, full-scale nuclear war, provided the situation does not alter, at 2% per year. And anybody can do the simple calculation that shows that 2% per year means that the chance of having that full-scale nuclear war with at least, most conservatively estimated, those 50 million Americans killed, by 1990 is one in three, and by 2000 is 50-50. I think I know what's bothering the students. I think that what we're up against, they, we, all of us, is the threat of representing an apocalyptic generation, a generation that is by no means sure that it has a future. I think that's what we're up against. And if that's right, if those are the odds, and don't take my word for those odds, I hope it's not unfair for me to suggest that you might ask Hans Peter tonight and Garal Perovitz, who will be talking to you, how they place the odds on full-scale nuclear war before 1990 or 2000. I expect to be here. I'd love to hear what they say. And so I think that the problem of our generation, and I'm getting old, so it's your generation, but there are those students of mine who are in my mind always. And I have two young children, seven and nine. So it's my generation in every real sense, too. Is it to have a chance to live? We don't ask prosperity. We don't ask security. But a decent chance to live and to work out our destinies in peace and decency. That's the problem. Without more assurance than we now possess that this generation has a future. Nothing else matters. It's not good enough to have given it tender loving care, to have supplied it with breakfast foods, to buy it expensive educations. Those things don't mean anything unless that generation has a future. And we're not sure that it does. I don't think there are student problems. All the real problems I know are grown-up problems. Thank God the students are getting into them. But that's where they are.
You'll think perhaps that I'm crazy or at the least sentimental if I say as I do to you now, we have to get rid of those nuclear weapons. There's nothing worth having, nothing worth having, ideologically, nationally, any old way. There is nothing worth having than can be obtained with nuclear war. It's utterly self-defeating. <laughs> Those atom bombs represent an unusable weapon. The only use for an atom bomb is to keep someone else from using it. There's no protection. All we can be offered in connection with them is the doubtful virtue of retaliation. They offer nothing to us and can offer nothing to us but a balance of terror, and a balance of terror is still terror, and we can't live in a balance of terror. We have to get rid of those atomic weapons. I think we've reached the point of great decision, not just for our nation, not only for all humanity, but for life on this earth. It's taken man three billion years, three billion years of life on this earth to reach this point. I tell my students with great pride, because that's the kind of thing I'm proud of, that this carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen that makes up 99% of me and of you, those elements were cooked in the deep interiors of previous generations of dying stars. They've come from all the corners of the universe over billions and billions of years. Three billion years ago, life began on this planet. It's three billion years old. Many a star has been born and died since life arose upon the earth. And about two million years ago, it bred man. And now, man has become the dominant species on the earth. The only life in the solar system is the life on Earth. And we are the custodians of all that life. All plants and animals by now live by our sufferance. It's a big responsibility. And that thought that we're in competition with Russians or with Chinese is peanuts. It's for the birds. It's trivial. What our task and our fate and our destiny, if we can live it out, is, is on a cosmic scale. There's life all over this universe. But the only life in the solar system is the life on Earth. And the only men in the universe are we. And we're the custodians of that life. And we're responsible and answerable for what happens to life on the Earth and in the solar system in our corner of the universe. And so I think that's the point. Our government, and not our government alone, most governments have become obsessed with death, with killing and being killed. But we scientists see that that isn't the game at all. And we opt for life. Our business is with life. And what is to become of life here? And all the rest of that is sheer frustration. <laughs>